My name is Michelle Vinicurv. I live with autism myself, and I am the blogger behind my own blog called The World of Autism. So this, the past year, last year, I have been recording guest interviews where I've been inviting guests who are individuals with autism, that are self-advocates. I've invited on here professionals, and also therapists, educators, families, and stuff. And I really wanted to just start off with this year by thanking to all those that came on last year. And we are continuing on into the new year with my very first guest of the new year. We have Stephen Cohen here. How are you doing, Stephen? Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Pleasure to be here. Now I'm glad you are here too. So we're gonna start off here by letting you share about your experiences growing up with autism. So as we had discussed in, in the, the pre, um, I grew up in the next town over <laughs> uh, and we could never decide what to call it, but <laughs> it, was a, it was a town and come, I think it was preschool, we knew something was different, but it, it ultimately took us fast forwarding a little bit until we got to Southern New Jersey about a half an hour or roughly from Atlantic City to formalize the Asperger's diagnosis, which in the United States no longer functionally exists, unfortunately. Uh, but in the, that intervening time frame from four or five until 12, we had hit around everything else but Asperger's. Uh, and it was just growing up in one of the best states in the country, kind of looking in retrospect as compared to the national average of things that continues to grow by itself. It's, it's been nice to see as I've moved across the country, first to St. Louis and now for the last soon to be 14 and a half years here in Las Vegas, that many of the issues that New Jersey has already figured out um, at this point, given its higher incidence rate than the national average, that Nevada kind of, it's like pu it's pulling teeth to move the needle on that. Mm -hmm. Right, and like, have you, do you feel like you got better support like it, when you moved and everything? So it, it's kind of interesting. That's what prompted our move, our initial move to begin with. Mm -hmm. Once I started high school, we were in similar to Central, a scenario where three towns had a single high school. So the town we lived in and then the town both north and south of us. It was 5,000 students between the three towns, and it was just stimulatory hell. And ultimately, you know, it, ju it just got to the point where if we had stayed, we would have ended up filing due process. Because the, the child study team in Southern did not get it at all. And I mean, I, I can remember even further back than that in, in Central, once we moved from an elephant to Homedell, my, I forget if it was fourth or fifth grade, I think she was science and math teacher um, telling, I forget if it was the child study team and or my mom, I don't have time to review the IEP. Well, you, you know, and kind of the, the retort was, well, you better because you're, you're the teacher that's implementing the accommodations. And so plus make, that's make required. <laughs> yeah. Plus that's required. So, huh. So to, to answer your original question, what we ended up doing, and we were looking at um, all over the country, because by then my dad had retired um, from private industry in Manhattan. So we weren't, we weren't tied down to any one particular place. So we, uh, 
we thought about moving out here then, but the district here, and it's still the same 20 plus years later, also did not get it. I mean, what, what sold not moving out here then for us was the issue of redistricting. So as the town grew, you could get a great, whatever they call a child study team out here at school A, and then the population in your area grows and you get moved to school B right up the street and have a horrible team. So what we found out later was, because our realtor's wife happened to then be a principal in the district, is we could have requested a, um, I forget what the technical term is for it, but to stay at the same school all the time. Okay. Um, but, you know, it, that, to make a long story short, once we finally had that diagnosis sealed, all three of our lives changed forever. Did you feel like once you found out about your diagnosis, did you feel like relieved about it? Yes and no, because it, it's mm -hmm. something that's still still a struggle 20, almost 21 years later. Um, but it's, you know, it's just, you got to, you got to figure it out. You know, you got to kind of figure out how to try to integrate into a, a world of primarily neurotypicals. You know, it, it's unfortunate, but you've, you can't anticipate that they're going to adapt to you. You've got to adapt to them. And, and it's sometimes, especially in, in governmental systems, it's a struggle. You want to throw them against the wall. You know, when you have to repeat yourself four different ways to ask the same darn question. I mean, I just had to do it this morning. You know, in, in one of the things. I'm like, I wasn't, I'm not asking the scopes trial here. You know, I'm asking a basic question. Mm -hmm. And for you to respond to me, then I got to worry about, you know, how to rephrase the question so you understand what the heck I'm asking. You know, and it's, it's just, and like I said, it's just, it's really frustrating and it's, it's become even more so since COVID because, because you've lost that in large part as uh, many states and, and ours was one of the first to shut down. It kind of took that social element away in person that many of us benefit from. You know, it's, there are certain things that are more conducive to an in-person environment than a virtual environment. You know, you, You're absolutely right about that. I can even tell you because I work as a paraprofessional and in, in, um, I actually work in the town in, um, from Marlboro, but uh, I could tell you this, that like, with the students that I work with, because I work with elementary school students that live with autism in a self-contained classroom. And I tell you that the the difference of in-person, I we are we're on a hybrid instruction schedule and currently this week that we are teaching virtually. So the diff it's a huge difference between virtual instruction and in-person. Yes, I do admit that there is a lot more benefits of in-person, like you're saying, but with social skills, that's the number one thing that, like, where all of us that live with autism struggle with is social skills. And so to get that taken away, um, you know, it's definitely not easy. And it does make it a little bit harder. But at the same time, like, I know from my own experiences right now, like, been teaching online, it's like, you gotta get very creative <laughs> yep. when it comes to with the circumstances. And what you were saying about with um, with the child study team and everything from your experiences growing up, like I, you know, I think that what they need to they need to really focus more on the kids at you know like to actually like 
understand what what's going on. I, I was gonna I was gonna say to individualize the supports because particularly mm -hmm. in autism, what works for one may not work for the rest. Yeah, and you're right about that. That goes to the same as what what I what what, what goes on in my classroom too. One technique is not gonna work may not always work with another kid. Yeah, there are some things that are the same, but most of the time, not really. <laughs> not really. You have to get very creative and most importantly, just to like understand like what is, what, understand the person themselves. That's the big thing that like, that more people need to know and everything. And also like to be, to continue to be educated because Clearly, and I can tell you firsthand that clearly there's still is a lot of work that has to be done. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my best friend teaches second grade here, so I I, oh. I live it on, on the teacher side of it. <laughs> and I, I imagine <laughs> I'll get a call at, at 2.30 when she's done, you know, because we weren't able to connect over the weekend, you know, and mm -hmm. just filling in the blanks of, you know, how everybody's you know, kind of bouncing off the walls. They've had the two weeks to to sit and do nothing, so to speak, and just kind of getting back into that routine for both sides mm -hmm. takes some time. Right. Yeah, it, it really it takes a lot of time with just like <laughs> with the process and everything and like a lot of planning, a lot of planning. But um, now I'm wondering, like, what have what you do today? Like, the difference from back then, like from everything now, what about what you are doing today, like employment wise or, you know? So it's, um, I've become this volunteer navigator for folks to cut down the bureaucracy within the systems, they probably call them slightly different things in New Jersey, but both rehab, the waiver programs, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, because one, once you've lived it, you know, you get, you get to have a target on your back when, when you don't sit and, and uh, accept the status quo. So you, you ultimately make the right contacts to help others. Hmm. So is it kind of like, I'm trying to think of it. Is it, because I know here it's like the um, dis uh, disability rehab vocational services. That's what they call it here. Yeah. Our, ours is called vocational rehab. Same, oh, same, okay. same exact thing. Okay, so that is very cool. Very cool. So you you help individuals to get like acts resources and supports, right? Oh yes. <laughs> very cool. That is awesome. Good for you. Yeah, well, it's an advocate right you here. Know, <laughs> the 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 prohibitions of social security are such that you really you really can't do much without without giving up those safety nets. Yeah. That's why it is important that they that they still have those established too, because got like just in case as a safety net. But uh, it's you know I could tell you from my own experiences. I actually have gone through personally through um, the disability uh, vocational rehab services myself because of for job employment re uh, reasons and stuff. Because that um, when I graduated from my community college. Uh, a couple years back almost now, two years ago almost, that I um, went through them because I was trying to find a full-time job until landed now. So, um, yeah, so that's very cool. Very cool. And, and how, how is your experience in going from um, pre- forget what the technical term is for it, but from at, from seeking services to ultimately, presumably closure at this point? Um, so I'll tell you a little bit with my own that like, you got to put in the work yourself. A lot oh, yes. of times I honestly, 
like, yeah, they gave me a guide and stuff, but you, I, this is my advice to everybody that you got to put the work yourself into it because they're not always going to help you out. Just so. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> so, um, I applied for over 30 job applications until I, and went through like about 10 interviews that summer before, by the end of the summer, I landed into the job that I'm at today, which I've now um, maintained for almost two years in the school district. And I also was awarded recently best support staff of the school year, so. Congratulations. Thank you. So I, um, it just comes to show you, like you gotta put the work into it yourself. Like, yeah, it's good to have resources like that. And I highly recommend it that for anyone in Stephen's state, definitely go to Stephen. <laughs> um, for if you need any resources and support. And that just to remember, just to put in the work effort yourself. And it will pay off. Trust me. It definitely does. Just keep at it. But, um, that's awesome. What... Tell us more about like your experiences working for the um, the disability vocational rehab services. So, kind of point of clarification, I don't actually work for them, and that's a whole separate ball of wax that could be an episode by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so what what I'm doing is taking an outside lens and saying. If you're having this problem, here's who at all. So, for example, if you need assistive tech, you've got to call the assistive tech person. Mm -hmm. Your counselor may send over the referral, but ultimately, that's who you're going to be dealing with to get the need fulfilled. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's just like I said through my own client experiences now 14 and a half years here um, even as they change certain things slightly over time to adapt and and certainly mm -hmm. um, that has been a big topic this past year of course because of the pandemic uh, right. but functionally the system itself is substantially the same as it was 14 and a half years ago. Um, you know, as you said, you can you can apply with them all you want. That's great, but in our state, it literally is like pulling teeth to get anything done. Because, like I said before, if you're asking a basic question, it should not take a darn supervisor to resolve a problem or a manager. The first person should be able to fix it. They may not know the answer, but they should know how to ask the supervisor for help. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Now I, I, I kind of see now what you mean, but it's good. It's nice that you still, in a way, like you're still helping out others, like in, in providing resources and stuff. So that is awesome to hear that very awesome, Stephen. So to wrap things up here, what the last thing I'm going to ask, and I always ask this to my guest on here, is that what advice would you give? Hmm. What advice would I give others on like, the spectrum? Mm -hmm. Yep. Just don't don't let any the sky's the limit. I guess is the best way to put it. Don't don't let any person or system hold you back from what you truly want to achieve in life. That is true. That is true. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen, for coming on here to share your story. Not a problem. My pleasure.